good evening, everybody. Uh, as has just been said, I have lots of um, slightly ridiculous job titles. I'm also the Prime Minister's Ambassador to Tech City, which, for those of you who've never heard of, is Shoreditch. <laughs> um, but mostly my job is, is working as a futurist. Uh, a futurist is really somebody who is paid to, to live a year or two in the future and then come back and explain what it's going to be like. Um, for those of you who don't live in 2014, as I do, you won't know that in January next year, PowerPoint slides will be made illegal under the International War Crimes Tribunal. So, I don't actually have any slides. You're just going to have to listen to me instead. I'm sorry about that. The reason that this job exists and the reason that I work around the world sort of talking to audiences and to, to boards and to cabinets and so on about the future is really down to a quote by the science fiction writer William Gibson. And he said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And this, I think, is a very important point when we're talking about cyberspace, or when you're listening to somebody like me speak, is you have to bear in mind that I'm going to, everything I say in the next 15 minutes is absolutely 100% true to at least 10 million people. It's just not necessarily any of you. And so I'm going to make some generalizations, and some of you will be sat there going, what are you talking about? Believe me, I could give you case studies or fly you to San Francisco and just let you loose. But just, just go with it for any of the examples that I give. Because of that fact that the future, this future is already here and, and I can find case studies of pretty much anything I'd like to say and tell you about the modern world, it means that somebody like myself, somebody who's called a futurist, is, is capable of basically saying anything. You can go to a lecture about technology, you can pick up the technology press, you can go onto the web, you can read any of this sort of stuff, you can read Wired magazine, for example, which I'm contributing editor to, and you will find an infinite number of stories about what the internet means or what uh, smartphones mean or what they're going to do in the future, any of these things. And, and because they are all absolutely true to at least 10 million people and, of course, absolutely false to everybody else, um, it's very difficult to really take any lessons away unless you get right down to the, the basic level of understanding. So I'm going to just take you very quickly to the really the three main things that I think you should understand if you're going to understand the future and the, the Armageddon of cyberspace. There are three really major movements to understand for the 21st century. And if you don't understand them, then, then the world is going to be incredibly confusing. The first one is Moore's Law. Now, of course, everybody here knows what Moore's Law is, but I'll just remind you. It's a rule of thumb in the microprocessor industry. It was invented by a man called Gordon Moore, who's the co-founder of Intel, the people who make the microchips. And in the, in the early 60s, he looked at his sales brochure, and he realized that roughly every year to 18 months, the number of components on an integrated circuit for the same price would double, roughly every 12 to 18 months. And he wrote this down in an internal memo. And in the 70s, they looked at it again. And they realized that this trend had remained the same. And indeed, it remains the same to this day. And we think it will remain the same for another 20 or so years. Simply stated, every 12 to 18 months, for the same price, computing power doubles. Or conversely, for the same amount of computing power, the price halves. Now, this has been running, as I say, since at least the 60s and continues to this day. And uh, the mathematicians amongst you will have noticed this is an exponential curve. It's a doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling again. This is really the first time in human history we've had technology that gets twice as good every year or so. Now, the reason, you know, so previously we would have had, say, uh, swords or horses, and swords didn't get twice as sharp every year. You know, horses didn't get twice as fast every year. And the reason for it is really, big, for many reasons, but one of the reasons is you don't, you, you use today's technology to design tomorrow's technology, and so it, it, that's where you get that doubling, because you don't use today's swords to make next year's swords as sharp. I mean, you do use today's horses to make next year's horses, but like we've reached the pinnacle of horse technology at this point. They can't carry any more songs, you see. So, 
so the, the, <coughs> the reason this is a very important thing to understand is because it really sets the underlying um, tone for the century. The first thing it sets is it makes it basically impossible to plan for pretty much anybody, and specifically for politicians and for generals. In the 20th century, there was a grand fashion for five-year plans. They didn't necessarily work out, but it was quite the fashionable thing. A five-year plan today has to take into account that the technology that we will have in five years' time will be 32 or 64 times as powerful as it is today. Now, we can't really conceive of what that will do. And that's in an easily planable four time period. If you're the Prime Minister, for example, and you walk into Downing Street, as, as David Cameron did a few years ago, with, with an, I, I imagine an iPhone 3GS in his pocket. Now, let's just imagine that he gets re-elected Prime Minister. At the end of the second term, he will walk out of, of Downing Street to go on a holiday and will have an iPhone 15 in his pocket. Now, that will be an iPhone 256 times as powerful as the one he had in his pocket when he started the job. Or, conversely, he might have an iPhone 3GS still, because he really likes Angry Birds and he doesn't want to give up the thing. <laughs> Which means that going by Moore's law, and again, you can hand wave around this, but going by Moore's law, at least the electronics inside will be 1 256th the price as it was before, which means that iPhone 3GS will have been free with a package of cornflakes. We have gone, taking the iPhone as an example, in the past six years since the iPhone has been available, we have gone from no, no smartphones at all in the country to the end of this year, 75% of the population having a smartphone. Again, to put it into context, the uh, modern iPhone is three times as powerful as a Cray 3 supercomputer which, for those of you who saw Superman 3, was the cool black one with the sofa built into it. The cool supercomputer. We have unimaginable amounts of computing power in our pockets. And we, deeply unimaginable five years ago. Which means that if you're making five-year plans, or if you're making 10-year plans, or you're making a 20-year career plan, you're really making it on the basis of complete fantasy. Because there's no way now that you can make a genuinely good prediction about what the future is going to hold. Because the world is being driven by technology we can't really predict. And I mean consumer technology, just random stuff you can buy in the Apple store in Dixon's. I don't mean alien technology held under the mountain in America. I mean just stuff you can buy from Amazon. So Moore's law continually drives this, this thing on. Which leads us to our second issue. The second issue is that we are all half cyborgs. Everybody here, to a certain degree, is half robot. Slightly rubbish robot, but half robot nonetheless. Let me explain what I mean. Um, everybody has a, who has an iPhone or a smartphone in their pocket? Right. Uh, yeah, so they all switched off here? Yeah? Yeah, good. Right. So the main thing about these, so no, no, like I say, so this is an unevenly distributed future. So there are some people in the room who are going like, I've no idea what you're talking about. There are plenty of people who do, right? If you've got somebody sat next to you who's like shaking their head and you're desperate to check Twitter, right? If you're the person, so like nudge them. Okay. So we, there are many of us who have these, these devices that are never more than three feet away from you any time in your existence, right? It's in your pocket next to your skin for the entire conscious waking day. It's probably on the table next to your head when you're asleep. It's probably on the shelf in the bathroom when you're having a shower. Unless you're really into Facebook, in which case you shower like this. <laughs> right? These things have become so much part of your life, such an intimate device, that to all intents and purposes, it is part of you. In the old days, in old science fiction, we used to talk about people having the internet plugged into the back of their brains. Little skull, skull, skull jack. You know, there are lots of, lots of science fiction films with that in there. That will never happen because of Moore's Law, because nobody wants to be the person with, the, with last year's model of plug. <laughs> right? The upgrade would be very embarrassing, for one thing. And you wouldn't want to be the person who had to have the, like, the ugly adapter. You know. <laughs> oh, you've still got a serial port. Oh. 
Yeah. So, so those plug things won't happen, but it doesn't matter because we have these devices that are incredibly intimate to us. And we have not only gained superpowers from these devices, we know where we are on the planet within three feet. We're able to magically put our thoughts into other people's heads using these things. We have access to all of the world's knowledge. I mean, in the olden days, if you couldn't remember something, you would scratch your head, and it would eventually come to you. Nowadays, you sort of scratch your robot brain, and it eventually comes to you. It's effectively the same thing. So not only have we been given superpowers by these devices, but they've become entwined in our minds. Now, we know this. There have been at least three studies. The last one was out of Harvard last year, which shows that we give a certain proportion of our brain to monitoring our robot brains. Now, you know this, those of you who use smartphones a lot, because 90% of you who use a smartphone a lot, sometime in the past week, will have felt your phone vibrating in your pocket when it wasn't vibrating. This is called a phantom vibration. It shows, <laughs> shows that your brain is going wrong a little bit, as brains do. 45% of you, you don't have to admit this, but 45% of you who use smartphones a lot will have felt in the past week your phone vibrating in your pocket when you were holding it in your hand. <laughs> Many studies have shown this. This means that we are deeply entwined with these things. So the future, the first two things, is the future is that the technology doubles and doubles and doubles in power every, you know, every year or 18 months, and we get to be much more entwined with it as we go along. Which leads us to the third and most important point to make about these things. When we talk about technology in the 21st century, we are not any longer talking about a box of electronics. We're not talking about something separate from humanity. We're not talking about just, you know, like a printing press that's in a room over there, and we go and visit it, and it has a, it has a purpose, and we can talk about it as if it was a separate thing, separate from us. When we talk about cyberspace and the internet and, you know, and digital devices and smartphones and all these things today, we are talking about something which is deeply entwined in ourselves and in society. The internet is not a thing. The internet is something you do. Cyberspace is not a, an, another thing that we depend on. Cyberspace is where we live now. And so when we talk about things like you know, the Armageddon of cyber, in cyberspace and so on, when we talk about like, it going wrong, we can have the technical discussion, and I can, I, can, I can put your mind at rest, cyberspace won't fill up. We're all good with that. But the, when we talk about this, we can have the technical discussion, but really we need to be having the social discussion. We need to be talking about cyberspace as if we're talking about the community, or society, or our family, or, or the air in which we breathe, the weather. It has the same equivalency these days as cyberspace. So really now we have to think about why we talk about Armageddon, why so many people are frustrated with this, why so many people are concerned about these things. Yes, it is because it's so important to our daily lives. It's so entwined with our daily lives that if you were trying to rip it away, you would, you would, it would be like pulling off a scab. You would rip, rip most of your leg off with it. But really, I would posit that this talk of Armageddon in cyberspace is yet another example of a popular cultural movement that desires Armageddon that desires the apocalypse. And that this talk about Armageddon in cyberspace is taking one worry about technology, but is actually taking a whole load of other worries about the modern world and looking for a big reset button. The way that the, the internet works, technically speaking, means that it won't fail globally. I can put your mind at rest there. But many people would quite like it to do so. Even if you look at Hollywood over the past few years, and the major TV shows over the past few years, the major theme of these things has been the zombie apocalypse, or the post-apocalypse sort of post world. And there is this yearning in modern culture for a grand reset in order to basically turn off modernity, because we're confused by it and want it to go away all in one lump. This isn't going to happen. 
Because the real issue with cyberspace is because it is us, it will continue. Human beings are amazingly resilient people, resilient creatures. And so when we're talking about Armageddon, we have to come to terms with the fact that not that it might happen, but that it never will happen. We have to come to terms with the fact that the internet isn't going to break, that it isn't going to destroy the world, that actually we are going to have to get up and go to work tomorrow, no matter how much we might want the internet to crash overnight. So if it's not going to happen, if there isn't going to be an Armageddon, what are the things we have to worry about? And this is where I'll finish very quickly. I think there are two genuine threats to the internet or to cyberspace. Two, two threats which will make cyberspace less happy. The first one is complexity. We have built enormously complex systems in many parts of our lives, specifically the finance sector. And this complexity means that there are whole areas of cyberspace that we don't understand. There is a theory, there's a science fiction theory called the singularity. And the singularity happens when computers get so clever that they start to design themselves. And after a while, they design themselves better and better and better. And the, and the singularity happens when the computer, computer systems designing themselves become cleverer than humans. And I was talking, this is, I'm going to name drop. I'm very sorry. I was talking about this on stage with Al Gore. And Al Gore says, <laughs> Al Gore says, did you see the Pope? No, I'm saying, Al Gore says, well, of course, that's already happened. And he pointed out, and this is true, I researched it for my last book, 90% um, of all of the stock trades that happened around the corner aren't made by humans. They're made by artificial intelligences doing it for us. We have now got to the point where many of our human systems have become so entwined with cyberspace that we no longer understand them. And it's our lack of embracing cyberspace which brings this on. And the second issue, when we talk about real cyber warfare, as we're going to be talking about later, is a matter of public health and hygiene. We look at the problems of the internet through the old frameworks. We look at cyber warfare as if, as the cliche goes, the generals were fighting the last war. Cyber warfare and all of these things are, in my mind, and we'll talk about this, as I say, later, in my mind, not a matter of warfare at all, but a matter of national health and personal hygiene. If we really want to prevent a slightly squelchy Armageddon in cyberspace, then we need to be teaching each other how to wash our hands how to eat not and rotten food, and all the equivalent other metaphors about, about health as a digital thing. But we must remember at the end of the day that no matter how bad things get, no matter how many attachments we click on, no matter how crazy the Chinese or the Syrians or any of the other people get, no matter how much cyber warfare occurs, no matter how complex cyberspace gets, it's not going to be Armageddon, and we still have to get up tomorrow and go to work. And so we must embrace these technologies, because this is the only world that we've got to live in. Thank you very much.